Welcome, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to be here and to see so many friends here. Um, I um, want to extend um, my really warmest thanks to Kathleen Murphy for her leadership of the Women in STEM Cooperative. Uh, she is uh, a truly inspiring uh, leader to us, and I uh, always feel myself pushing a little bit harder to make sure that I come up to her standard um, in, and can meet her expectations um, as uh, a contributor to the Women in STEM Cooperative. Um, I'd also like to thank the rest of the committee. Uh, she named many of the leadership members, but the, there are many, many people behind the scenes making our events and um, activities happen, and I'm so grateful to all of them. It's a great delight to work with the team. Um, like you, I'm disappointed that the Chancellor couldn't be here today, and I'm also uh, here to share with you a message from her that she is also disappointed that she couldn't be here today. I can promise you she will make it up to us, and I can promise you that because I am her dean. <laughs> <laughs> um, she did send in a good, a good excuse. <laughs> um, so... Um, we are strong and resilient people, and we've put together a great panel discussion for today um, in the absence of the Chancellor being here. I do want to say why we were so excited, though, by the Chancellor's um, attendance, um, just in case you weren't already inspired by what you've read about her in the newspapers. She um, is the founder and president of a company called Cube Hydro. And when I first read that, I thought, oh, well, it's probably some small startup with some you know, technology that relates to hydropower. Um, it is no small startup. Um, the, Chancellor, the Chancellor's company owns 19 different power stations in five different states that are generating power from hydroelectricity. Um, and the important thing about it, and the reason it's such a, um, an interesting uh, company from a sustainability perspective, is that they're retrofitting hydro plants onto existing dams. So dams have their own special set of challenges for the environment, and instead of building dams, they're saying we can take existing dam infrastructure and use it to create sustainable uh, power or green power, um, which is an amazing um, uh, direction to head in, and she's a true leader in that regard. All right, without further ado, I'm going to ask my panelists to come up and join me, and we're going to um, sit in the comfy chairs and start a good discussion about uh, sustainability. Come on up, team. Welcome. I am not going to spend very much time introducing our speakers because I want them to speak themselves about their contributions to sustainability. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, Hadar Borden. And um, Hadar, who's uh, sitting at my far right, um, is the program director of our Blackstone Launchpad um, initiative here at UB and the director of the Western New York Prosperity Fellowship Program. Um, in these roles, she actively works with our students who are interested in entrepreneurship to fulfill their aspirations aspirations in terms of starting new companies. She engages her community uh, also as a member of the Junior League of Buffalo, where she collaborates and innovates with a group of very inspiring and very accomplished women. And additionally, she serves as a board member of the University Heights Tool Library. Um, and I'm hoping she can maybe touch on that. Um, she's a member of the board for Women Elect and is a trustee on the board of the Buffalo Jewish Federation and participates in the Western New York Women's Foundation Advocacy Committee. I don't actually understand how she does all that as well as her full-time job and runs her family's uh, uh, activities as well. So she's clearly keeping herself very busy. So Hadar, welcome. You spend a good portion of your life working with young women who are leveraging STEM to become budding entrepreneurs. Could you tell us a little bit about what it's like to work with all this potential? Sure. Um, so I've been in my role for two years, and I've had the opportunity to meet creative and what I call ambitious women. As women, we typically shy away from the label entrepreneur, uh, but we embrace founder. And I'm not really sure why that is. As women, we look for a purpose. That's what I've learned. And we look to solve problems, and we look to impact change in our communities. I've had 
I've learned that as women, we look for innovative solutions to systematic problems to make an impact. Um, for example, when we first opened our doors, I met uh, Ramla Koresh, who is a PhD in our civil engineering program here at UB, and she is a founder of Women Engineers Pakistan. And Ramla is determined to provide opportunities for women in her home country um, to pursue STEM. And the one piece that I, um, took away from my conversation with her. Um, she's very humble, one, um, but she told me that she had 8,000 Facebook followers on her page and didn't think that she was doing enough. And as women, I think that's often the case. We just don't think that we're doing enough um, to impact change. Um, so that's just one small story. What we know is that entrepreneurship and innovation are drivers and key strategies for economic development, uh, for job creation, for growth, for realization of so social gains that help to meet the United Nations sustainability development goals. Locally, we know that our Western New York Regional Economic Development Council has also identified entrepreneurship as a strategy to lift Western New York to help revitalize and sustain our region. And that is really why I enjoy working in the entrepreneurship world. Um, for me, I, I kind of felt like I went back like 180, back to my corporate world. Um, and I thought, oh, am I selling out in some way? Um, but no, um, economic development is at the heart of helping others and building um, our community and solving those systematic problems. The good news I want to share with you, because I think there's a lot of really good news, women are starting 1,200 new businesses per day in the US, and one third of those are by women of color. That's 17% higher than 17 years ago. In addition, we live in one of the um, world's best countries. Uh, of 30 countries profiled in the gender GDI index, the best places to be a woman starting a business are the US and, of course, Australia. Locally, we've increased engagement of female students in Blackstone Launchpad from 30% when we opened our doors to 40%. And, and key to that is making sure that there are women in leadership within the organization. Um, and I think that's a testament to having Dean folks as the Dean of Engineering. I think we've been able to recruit so many more students um, and women to our STEM fields because we have leaders um, at the top that are women. Um, so that's key. And we've achieved for us um, in Blackstone 50% representation. And I think that's what we're all trying to achieve equal representation in all fields and all the industries um, where we have competitions with social purpose. And I say that uh, we hosted an aging innovation sprint and the World's Challenge Challenge where we had 50% of the participants were women. Um, so we know that what drives us is a purpose, um, finding solutions to problems bigger than what we encounter. And we have a lot of more work to achieve, equal representation and support of our female founders, but I believe the path is bright. Thank you. Thank you, Hadar. That was a great introduction to the role of women in the um, small business and entrepreneurship space. I want to pivot now to Ali McPherson, um, who spent over 20 years leading innovative environmental initiatives that leverage collective creativity of communities and large corporations. And by large corporations, I mean Apple, HP, Patagonia, Walmart, and others. Um, now here at Niagara Share, Ali is working to foster a globally connected place-based regenerative economy strategy to leverage, to leverage environmental entrepreneurship um, and uh, by working with private and public sector leaders on new opportunities and possibilities that account for emerging megatrends like climate change and resource deprivation and um, loss of biodiversity as well. She co-leads the Collaborative for Regenerative Economy with UB and Clean Production Action and also directs the Investor Environmental Health Network, which advises managed assets of over $60 billion. Ali, can you talk a little bit to us about um, your time working with large corporations in particular to integrate sustainability in the corporate world and how do you think things have changed over the last two decades in that space and specifically where do you where have you seen the role of women in those corporations as leaders for sustainability well um thank you um for that and thank you for the opportunity to be here i mean it's just really inspirational um for me um 
There, I think, has been such a sea change over the last two decades. Um, when I moved back to Buffalo, I was in my mid-20s. I left um, doing environmental policy work in um, Washington, D.C., and I had this opportunity to lead a clean production project for um, clean, uh, Great Lakes United, an environmental NGO based in Buffalo. And I worked for two years on sustainability issues in the auto sector. So it was a really tough entry um, into an industry sector. Um, and I partnered with the University of Tennessee's um, Center for Clean Technology, um, and with, I worked with engineers to develop um, a clean car platform. And it was really a blueprint for how automakers could improve their footprint through clean production and cleanly fueled cars. And we spent a few years working with the big three um, automakers, and, and they really had to come to the table because we were in part funded by the EPA. Um, but you know, predominantly, I was the only woman at the table. And um, I was so inspired and excited by what we could achieve through green chemistry and green engineering. It was really my first taste into this world of possibility of STEM. Um, but uh, that was not equally received by um, the automakers, <laughs> particularly um, General, um, General Motors and Demler Chrysler. They sort of brushed us off, um, pie in the sky, absolutely not relevant to their um, business plans or brands. Um, and, and with the exception of Ford Motor Company, it was like, it was a tough entry, but I was just so inspired by green chemistry and green engineering, even though I had my degrees in English um, and communication. So um, shortly thereafter, I co-founded Clean Production Action, and we built um, a team of um, largely women engineers and chemists um, to develop solutions to clean production. And our focus was really on replacing uh, toxic chemicals with safer alternatives. And we really um, piloted projects in the electronics sector. So this led me to Silicon Valley, um, another completely male-dominated world um, where I was working with Dell and HP and Apple. Um, and over this course of 10 years, uh, we saw sustainability plans put in place, green chemistry teams built, and sustainability leaders on executive teams, like what we see today with Lisa Jackson at Apple. Um, and when I look back, um, while the gender balance in Silicon Valley was not much better than Detroit, the engineers and product designers willing to work with us, um, apply new solutions, create transformative change for sustainability in science and technology were women. These were women who took risks, they found paths forward, and you know, now today I work with large-scale companies in other sectors that represent almost every major facet of the economy. And my colleagues leading sustainability at Walmart, Amazon, HP, Apple, the list goes on and on, are predominantly women. So I believe there's just been the sea change on two levels. One, these major companies have sustainabilities in place and often have executive support and buy-in now, and that executive support is often led by women. Um, and that, to me, gives me a lot of hope and confidence. So I'm excited for the discussion. Thanks, Ali. Um, and our third panelist is Dr. Samina Raja, who's the principal investigator of the Food Systems Planning and Healthy Communities Lab here at um, UB in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. Her research, teaching, and civic engagement focuses on the role of community-led local government planning and policy in building equitable, sustainable, and healthy communities. Her current projects focus on using the food system as a space for promoting food and health equity. Samina really personifies a role that we strive to achieve in higher education. She's both highly successful and globally known as a researcher. She's a phenomenal teacher, and she's someone who embraces her engagement mission in Buffalo and beyond. She's also someone who you don't want to cross because she has a triple black belt in Taekwondo. <laughs> So just, you know, don't get too perky out there in the audience, okay, with your questions. So, Samina, you work with a lot of elected officials, scientists, and community members, so you're really working in the public policy space. What do you see in terms of women at the table when it comes to creating policy around sustainability, and particularly women in STEM who are bringing the analytical perspective to what we could do? What are your experiences in that realm? Thanks for that great question. Uh, my observations are very similar to what we've heard from both of our guests here. Um, I will speak specifically about the public sector and for clarification, talk a little bit first about the space within which I work, which is public policy at the local government level, which is different than the federal government, different than the state government. To give you context, there are almost 40,000 local governments in the United States that are charged with delivering things like sewer networks in communities, roads, other kinds of public services. So these are 
entities that are responsible for making our communities work for us. Um, the curious uh, issue for me has been that these almost 40,000 governments in the United States, only 1% of them claim to be actively thinking about sustainable food systems. Let that sink in. But keep in mind that through their daily actions, when they decide to develop this plot of land and that plot of land, they are making decisions about sustainability and food, putting farmland out of production, for example. So in that bleak scenario, what are women doing? And where do I see women, especially those with analytical skills? Um, a little bit more doomsday first. So generally speaking, sustainability is not present in mainstream public policy conversations at the local government level, not the way we would like to see it. Um, but when it does appear, the, mirac not, not the, the fantastic thing is that it's often led by women. So the two examples that I would share here are two women uh, that I admire, one who I've observed from afar and one who I've had the opportunity to watch pretty closely. To give you the context for these two leaders, um, I'm going to give you examples from two leaders from the city of Baltimore in Maryland and a district called Trivandrum in Kerala, which is, south, which is a state in southern part of India. Uh, to say that women are demonstrating leadership and policy, both in relatively resource-rich environments, but even when they have very little to, at their disposal, they're still doing this. So city of Baltimore, um, the chief sustainability, uh, the city of Baltimore is one of the few in the country that has a chief sustainability officer. And the chief sustainability officer is a woman and has her undergraduate training in math and her graduate training in policy and really brings that combination of analytical skills but also the ability to think across sectors. So Baltimore, under her leadership, has adopted a climate plan. It has adopted a sustainability plan and the two are distinct. Uh, they have a disaster preparedness plan. They have a food systems plan, which obviously I care a great deal about. Uh, so that's city of Baltimore. Uh, fast, you know, going halfway across the world to Trivandrum and Kerala, the highest uh, elected official, not elected, sorry, oh, not elected, appointed official is a fantastic woman leader. That her designation is district collector, which means a big deal in India. Um, and her name is Dr. Vasuki. She was trained as a physician, but opted to not pursue a career as a physician, where she could have made a lot of money, but instead uh, took the civil service exam, ended up as this um, highly decorated official, and has managed in her position as a local government leader to make the city of Trivandrum an example of what a sustainable area could be. So uh, some of the ideas we've talked about, supporting smallholder farmers adapt to climate change, responding to disasters, she's done it all. Um, so what I'm seeing in short is that whenever sustainability pops up in policy circles, it is generally women's analytical skills, but also their ability to think across sectors that drives their leadership. Interesting. So um, if we, one thing I'm really interested in and what strategies that women can use to drive a, a sustainability agenda at any scale, right? So I know that there are many people in the audience who um, have frustrations around things that we do in our community, even on campus, that are not sustainable practices and would like to um, affect change. What ideas do you have between you for, for, or examples that you can share for exactly how to move your agenda forward um, um, in large organizations or small organizations or at the local government level? Like, where have you seen um, examples of strategies that have worked to, where individuals basically have stood up and said, I want to move this, I want to change the way we're doing business, I want to change the way we're functioning. Can you think of examples that have really worked? And I'm, I'm going to start with Hadar because I know that it's really... Um, you know, the idea of the lone entrepreneur with an idea to change the world lands in her office 
pretty regularly. <laughs> so we do have students that come in um, quite often with maybe what we think lofty ideas, but in their vision, they're, they're tenacious and they know that this is uh, something that's going to solve a problem that they've identified. And so what I always uh, suggest to them is they need to put together a pitch deck. Um, this has become my world. And so a pitch deck is just a proposal, um, but it helps you think about um, the points that you want to highlight. It helps you identify the problem, the solution, and then gain the support that you need. And most importantly, what we need is to provide the information, the statistics. So doing your research and the pitch deck allows you um, to put it in an organized fashion. So I think that's one um, key piece. Um, and any, whether you're an entrepreneur or what I like to call, and I borrowed this from Dean folks, is intrapreneurship. Is that individual within a large organization that's constantly striving for innovation and change to meet their, the institution's goal. Um, and so the entrepreneur in all of us needs to learn how to pitch, needs to learn how to influence um, and encourage others to come along with you. And you're going to have those people that are not going to support you, um, but that's not what you focus on. You, you focus on the people that are behind you, and, and in a way, um, they'll come along um, in the long term. That was great. Um, Ali, do you want to follow up on that? Um, any particular examples from inside large organizations? Yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, just going back to Silicon Valley and our work there, um, we, we worked really um, closely with Hewlett Packard, and um, Helen Holder was an engineer. She was a product designer um, in the company, sort of in a mid, you know, managerial position. And she was really inspired by the green screen, which um, was a tool to design out um, toxics in material and supply chains. And um, what people are often surprised of is like companies, big companies typically are just um, responding to regulation. They're not actually proactively looking at the types of materials in their products or screening them or having sort of environmental and human health criteria. And so the green screen was really a radical shift that Clean Production Action developed and wanted to pilot with a company. And um, and Helen really took that and I think had a sort of transformative footprint, not just on HP, but on the industry as a whole. And I think she did that because she really aligned it with um, the needs of her procurement team. So she, um, she didn't talk about, we, we talked about what was, what was environmental health, pollution. She talked about money. She talked about brand. <laughs> um, she talked about their reputation. Um, she had case studies of how HP had really lost money and how Europe was moving forward. She was just incredibly analytical, very smart. She built a team of um, people that really got bought into it at the executive level. And what is amazing to me today is that she went on to be one of the top women engineers at HP, and she built such an incredible program that we now work with 10 people within HP that then created an industry-wide collaboration. I mean, so it was just an amazing ripple effect of one person that found a pathway um, that was you know, incredibly analytical, creative, and collaborative. Terrific. Samina, do you want to add something? Um, simply that I think in all of these examples and the one definitely for Dr. Vasuki and Kerala, the ability to make unusual alliances and finding those alliances um, and having the ability to gauge, okay, so I'm interested in climate change, but my job is really about providing social services. How do I connect those two? Um, and what I observed in her case is that she was very strategic about going to people who were not necessarily talking about sustainability but she was, she found the language that they were using and bridging those connections. So very similar to what we've heard. So finding strategic alignment with the people that you need to have on your team, Absolutely. basically, mm -hmm. or on your side. Terrific. So um, we here at UB understand deeply the challenges that climate change uh, presents as well as the opportunity of focusing on solutions. And as we work to implement solutions-based climate work, do you feel that women are strategically inclined to make progress in addressing climate change, particularly as they rise into greater leadership roles? And why do you think that might be? And I'll throw that open to anyone who wants to, to catch it. Well, um, 
You know, I, I, I just, I think about this a lot, and um, I think about the world women navigate um, today, even with the privileges that we are sort of standing on the shoulders of these mighty giants who have pioneered equality for us. Um, but we're still underpaid, underfinanced, undersupported, underrepresented. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, but it is still true. I mean, it's a complex world we navigate. And I think similar to climate change, you know, it's just not, you know, it's supported enough. And so, you know, as we go forward, you know, we have built skills through that perseverance, um, you know, team building. I, we, we have really taken the long view because we have to. We're systems level thinkers. These are all skills that really serve us well in climate change and dealing with the complexity of climate change. So I think that's, you know, because we've had to and because we care so much for our planet, for our homes, for our families, climate change is innately about caring for our home and, and people. I couldn't agree more. Any other comment there? I was just going to add that um, there are lots of scientists in the room, I'm sure, so this doesn't come as any surprise, but we know that international and international organizations are recognizing that some of the most complex problems in the world cannot be answered without work across disciplines. So National Science Foundation, for example, now has a program called Food, Energy, and Water. National Science Foundation has discovered that you cannot just talk about food, you cannot just talk about water. So that sort of intersectoral thinking tied to climate change is percolating into our highest you know, scientific organizations. But it seems that women have been making that observation for decades. So within the sciences, if you look at where women tend to gravitate, they tend to start in the sciences in very analytical spheres and then push out into fields that are broader. So I'll use myself as an example. I started out as a civil engineer and then it was too narrow. It didn't serve a purpose and then I looked for something broader. So for climate change, it seems that women already have the analytical skills and then the add-on of being able to look across sectors. So yes, they're ready to lead. <laughs> In case you were questioning it, you're all ready to lead. Um, so given that, why do you think we're so challenged in terms of attracting women to STEM disciplines in Western countries? And I'm very, being very clear there that it is um, uh, a peculiar challenge for Western countries. There are many non-Western countries where, that have even more than 50% um, of their graduates uh, being women in, for example, the engineering disciplines. Um, but it's common knowledge that um, you know, one of the reasons that we hear is that STEM disciplines don't appear to be purpose-based, that it doesn't help us to figure out how to save the planet and help the people in our communities. How do we change this perception? Because from my perspective, I feel like, well, actually, we probably hold the keys to helping people and solving uh, the biggest challenges we have if we have strong analytical skills, which we're only going to get through a STEM pathway. Um, do people have thoughts about that? How do we change the How do we change the dialogue so that more women become engaged in the STEM disciplines, get this analytical training that will enable them to go on, and save us all? Because <laughs> really, that's pretty important. <laughs> I'm going to jump in on this one. Um, so. This past weekend, um, I had the pleasure of leading a group of um, really passionate um, women, um, founders, uh, women in education and STEM education in an initiative called Girls Get It. Um, because we believe that you have to inspire and encourage and support girls at a young age. So many of you here are high school um, age, and this program was really focused on sixth to 10th grade girls to really help them understand what careers in technology, what entrepreneurship is all about. Um, I have two boys. I have a 14-year-old and a, a almost 12-year-old, and the 14-year-old is um, in eighth grade. And he's been involved in Science Olympiad. And I will tell you that in Science Olympiad, at a suburban in a school here, uh, they only had four girls that were part of the team. That was shocking to me. I did everything that I could to help him like understand how he could um, invite some of his girl friends. They're not girl friends, but girl friends. 
um, to the team. And he said, you know, I, I tried, but there's just no interest. So I think we need to, at an early age, show purpose in um, the STEM world. I think what we did this past weekend, we had about 150 girls come out, um, and we introduced them to the world of technology, um, what you can do with computer science. And we looked at it through the lens. There was a Fashion Lab NY uh, program. There was Zandra, who focuses on skincare products, and she herself, as a middle schooler, uh, started her own company. Um, so we try to introduce and encourage them early on. I think we do a great job when they come to campus. I think we have a program called WISE here, Women in Science and Engineering, and I think that's wonderful. Um, but we also need to really focus on that sixth to 10th grade, when they're most impressionable, when they're most um, inclined to be discouraged by maybe science or math teachers that say, you know, I'm gonna try to weed you out because I only want 20 kids in my class. They all have to be male? Well, <laughs> yes. Agree 100% with Hadar. In addition, um, using kind of the systems approach to this challenge, it's definitely important to reach girls directly, but it's an uphill battle if their teachers in middle school and high school and the broader media is creating a culture within which math and science is not cool. So we have a somewhat similar challenge in food. Parents teach their kids to eat well, but the food industry perpetuates advertising that really it's tough to counter. So the, in order to reach children, it's important to tackle direct information to children, but until and unless we change the context within which children are growing up in the United States, it's going to be this constant uphill battle. Um, advertising that points to women or young girls as not being intelligent, analytical, perpetuating those stereotypes in the media is just, I think, a huge concern for somebody who thinks about STEM for girls. Part two is that the use of language. I often wonder if we shouldn't be enlisting linguistics experts in STEM efforts. I notice constantly my graduate students in statistics classes would often say, I'm scared of math. I'm scared of statistics. Um, so I, my answer, question to them was, are you scared of poetry? And the answer is no. Well, poetry is also something that requires understanding and learning. Uh, math is also a language, but that is not the culture they are growing up in. And I think that thinking about changing the broader national narrative with the aid of smart linguistics might be really important for STEM leaders. That's a messaging challenge, right? It's how we think about the words that we use to describe the challenges that anyone has in doing higher level math and science. Yeah. Oh, well, and, I, and it's that growth mindset problem as well that too many students are exposed to messages from teachers that say, well, I can't do math and I can't do science, as if it's not a learned skill, it's an innate birthright or not, exactly. is a challenge for us. Yeah, still, I uh, very much agree. Um, so while um, clearly addressing climate change is a key priority, we've also been focusing here at UB on the UN's uh, global goals or the 17 Sustainable Development Goals um, as a, a framework to meet the challenges that we face. Um, what do you three see as key areas that we should be focusing on uh, here at UB, here in the Buffalo community? What are the things that we really need to pay the most attention to? And um, I'd point or ask you to think in particular in terms of our legacy um, here and history in terms of changing the national dialogue about sustainability. I don't know, maybe who wants to take that one on? Ali, maybe you're. Well, it, it, you know, it's it's well it's such a um, it's such a huge. Um, the, it's I love the sustainable development goals um, on one angle, and on the other angle, it's you really have to bring them down to a level that people can implement. And maybe I'm going to just feed off of the last question and connect it because I think 
the, you do have to change the national dialogue on how we solve problems and address challenges that are global, but it starts local. And I think um, you be really engaging in the community and piloting new ways of bringing science and technology to um, people, particularly young people, on the front lines is really a huge opportunity area. And I'm working with the Material Design Innovation Department um, on this project where we get this opportunity to bring them to the New York State STEM Master Teachers um, group that are just this courageous group of teachers that are <laughs> really hitting many of the sustainable development goals and what they do, but they are just putting so much time into empowering young people to get involved in science. So we get to bring the material design innovation team in to do courses and training with these 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds. And in part, we're doing that with local leaders, entrepreneurs on the ground here that can help translate. I think it's really important that people can help translate the sustainable development goals um, into um, how they affect people's lives on the ground here today and how they can really empower all of us. And so I think the work that you're doing, Hadar, on entrepreneurship is so important in connecting that with science and technology and really allowing young people to see pass forward and really achieving parts of of the uh, sustainable development goals through science and technology. What about old people? <laughs> <laughs> Them too. <laughs> no, but seriously, right? It, I mean, we have to, you know, at some level we created this mess. We can't just ride on the shoulders of young people and hope they're going to save us. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then the other part of that is that many of us have more power and authority as older people, and that means that there's an obligation, I think, to stand up and lead, um, which I guess goes back to this mission alignment, like the, the idea that where you do have a voice, we need to use our voices when we do have the opportunity to influence, to, to shape and nudge the agenda on really everything about our operations as a large organisation. I think um, not only our voice, um, but our, our platform. So thinking about, um, I spoke about women in, as leaders, um, leading organizations, but also the success stories that we put out there um, need to be about women and the many different things that they're doing in our community. Um, women in leadership, um, women that are rising and pulling each other forward and constantly sharing and not, not looking for opportunities to be negative, but more positive um, role models it's those words that we use, it's those images that people see that resonate with them um, and, and change the culture. Quite so. Um, so, um, what advice do you have for those of us um, who, are, who identify as women in STEM? I guess, so a way to frame this question is, what do you wish you had known when you were a student about driving change and towards sustainability? What wisdom would you like to share with the people in the audience who are still at that earlier stage? Or indeed wisdom for other people who are frustrated that they didn't pick up enough tools along the way to drive change in their organizations and are frustrated by a lack of, um, of transformation in our communities? I guess I would say that um, I'm that one person that you probably see at Wegmans that just will stop and talk to you um, or on the elevator. Um, <laughs> just me and so I would say just be open um, just open yourself up and share what you're doing um, you'll be amazed at the support that people will offer um, the excitement um, that you give off um, the encouragement um, and then the connections that will be there um, we talked a little bit about assisters and resistors and um, those assisters are key um, and that you only are able to identify those individuals that will support you by sharing what you're doing what you're interested in and bringing those people along with you. Make sure you know a person like Hadar. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, just go and knock on Hadar's door any day. <laughs> She's got a great central location right here in this building. <laughs> Ali. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, I would second that. And also just mentorship. And, and that's, you know, really what um, both of you, all of you are doing. Um, and having mentors um, 
that, you know, really inspire you to get through the tough times? You know, I mean, uh, Rachel Carson is in my head all the time. You know, her work in Silent Spring uh, transformed my view of science. And while I didn't um, get my degree in science and technology, had I read her book earlier, I would have. Um, and just having those people that circle around you that um, can, you know, continuously sort of help you get through the barriers, I think is one of the most important things you can do. Um, for your journey. May I elaborate on get to know Hadar? Absolutely. <laughs> um, it's about Hadar, for sure. It's also about um, the position and the place that Hadar has created for students at UB. Whether you're in high school or middle school or an undergraduate, in your very large organizations, there's got to be a person like that. There always is. And rather than trying to solve all our problems by ourselves, it might take actually less effort to find the Hadar. And it may uh, open up avenues that you may just not have thought about. Um, so that's, that was the reason behind find your Hadar. <laughs> So I, I think this is very powerful, this message and thought process, um, and coupled particularly with Hadar's initial um, observations, which is how important it is to develop your pitch. And a pitch doesn't, isn't only needed when you're trying to build a new company, but a pitch is necessary any time you're trying to institute organizational change. You've got to collect your thoughts and collect your data and find a compelling way to tell the story of how change is not only possible, but how it will impact us all for the better. And so those two things, the idea that I'm going to work on crafting my pitch and treat it seriously, the job of, of crafting my pitch, but then... The other thought that I would couple is that I am always astonished at how many random acts of kindness um, happen every day in the world because somebody talks to somebody who says, well, I can do that for you. I can connect you. I can have a good, put in a good word for you. I can help fund you. I can, I can take this issue forward in a different forum. It's unbelievable to me how generous most people are with their time and energy if they're convinced by your pitch. Uh, and being able to leverage all that free labor, basically, and goodwill is the thing that will elevate you and propel you forward, I would say. But no one knows you need help with whatever it is unless you're, you've, you're ready with your pitch, you're ready to share your story, you're willing to share your ambition and goals, because um, nobody knows what you need otherwise. Um, and I think also, once you can get in the habit of sharing your ambitions and goals and developing your pitch, um, you um, become empowered by the support that you can garner from other people. That then gives you momentum once you can get other people to, to say, oh, well, that sounds reasonable. You know, either here's $5 or I'll connect you with that person or whatever they're willing to do for you. All those little acts of kindness that are given freely really give you momentum and, and build your confidence to keep moving forward, I would say. Which, and it's amazing, it is absolutely amazing to me how many acts of goodwill and kindness there are in our university community, for example, every day. People who are just willing to step out of their comfort zone and say, here, let me give you a hand to the next step. It's just amazing. So I think that's, that's uh, really important advice. So... Um, as a woman, how do you identify allies and resistors to help you move your agendas forward? I think for me, I think it's um, just having those conversations and getting to know people. Mm. Um, and um, then I un you start to, when you have a conversation with someone and look and learn about uh, what drives them, um, why they, they do what they do, um, you then build that trust, and I think that's really important. And then from there, you move that relationship forward, and I think it's just cultivating those relationships and really getting to know people for who they are and what, they're, what drives them. I have a slightly different strategy. <laughs> I, I do do that. I talk to people. I, I will talk to you. Uh, but in terms of seeking alliances and who are the allies? Who will resist with me? 
I joke that I have a pretty short Kashmiri lifespan, so I'm not going to be around for very long. The actuarial tables predict 72 years. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> so um, I tend to, after I have identified people in an organization who might be allies, I generally go to somebody who I already trust. And I ask them, what do you know about how this person works? What do you know about their values? What do, the, what do you know about what drives them? And if there is alignment in our values and in purpose, I will spend time with them and work with them. Um, and if there isn't, then it's just a little bit, it may not be the right relationship for advancing the work. Um, I'm, I'll talk to anybody, but for alliances, I do a little strategizing. I sometimes call Hadar. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I do do that. Yeah, and I, maybe I'll put a little another twist on, um, on it. Um, I think sometimes uh, there's people that are really unlikely alliances and, um, and, and surprise alliances. And, and I really agree with what Liesl said. I mean, you would be so surprised at the people who do open the doors for you. And um, while we talk a lot about the importance of women, I can't um, you know, understate how important men have been in my life and, and positioning me. Um, and so I think that is a huge piece of it. Diversify your team, get people from different perspectives, get people who push you outside of your boundary. I think trust is huge, but I'm pushing always for NGOs. Go sit down with industry leaders, engineers, go sit down with people who push you outside your comfort zone safely and to take those risks. Which I think circles back to the value of getting in a room with people at having a face-to-face -face conversation um, in all of those comments, actually. Um, having the courage to go and sit down with somebody face-to-face -face and have a conversation about, well, and open up and say, this is what I really care about. This is what I'm trying to do. This is my mission. This is my goal. You will inevitably learn a lot more in a face-to-face -face conversation uh, because so much of our communication is not verbal and not written down in email. Um, getting face-to-face -face with people early and fast is really powerful, I would say, if you can manage it, if you can get that, get in that door. So um, this year's seen um, the advent of the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement in, in outing powerful sexual predators from uh, various industries, including, uh, regrettably, academia, embarrassingly, um, but also entertainment, media, politics, business, and sports. Actually, has anybody not touched now that I think about it? <laughs> we said politics. We'll say politics again, all right, then. Um, so um, uh, I actually didn't know there was such a booming industry in paying people off um, until this last week, so I'm, my head's still spinning that there's a whole business sector there that I wasn't aware of. Um, so... Um, uh, do you think, though, that social media um, could succeed at advancing other gender equality and sustainability initiatives where policy and education have failed, basically? And so, for example, there's a, a hashtag now, I want clean water now, uh, which I don't know whether Scott Pruitt is on <laughs> Twitter, but maybe he's seeing some of that um, and thinking about it from an EPA perspective, maybe. Um, but do you think that there's a possibility for social media to move the needle um, in ways that structured organizations haven't been able to um, in the realm of sustainability initiatives? Okay. They don't want to touch this, I can tell. <laughs> I will say this will not happen on a panel where there aren't only women deferring to each other. That's probably true. Um, so yes, I think there's an opportunity. Um, environmental justice movements, for example, have long clamored for attention around toxic waste, uh, certainly uh, neighborhoods where there aren't access to good food resources. Residents and women are often at the forefront of that. And my hunch is that we are going to see a more powerful use of social media to draw attention to that. Um, when that will happen, hard to say, but sounds like it's already happening. Um, but what's to me compelling about that possibility is that social media allows 
forging alliances between people with very limited power across the globe. And because sustainability is such a global issue, that's the power of social media. It's going to connect farmers in so southern India with farmers in western New York um, and women farmers in both places. I think uh, that's the power that we're going to be able to tackle global conversations, not just national or local. I'll just offer um, my perspective on in terms of social media. I think social media gives us a, a quick opportunity to um, get some ideas out there. And I think it's causing our traditional media um, to take notice. Um, and so I think you need a healthy balance of both. I think you need that social media to drive to kind of instigate um, other forms to really dig deep into issues and bring um, concepts to life. Um, you know, I, I think I really agree that it does connect people in, in incredibly important ways and, and will create cultural change. But I mean, it connects all people, good and progressive and unprogressive. So I just think that balance is there and that tension is there. And I do think um, it cannot replace um, the sitting down with a person and have in developing these deep relationships. I think it can build awareness and it can do a lot of good. I also think it can do a lot of bad if the communication framing isn't, you know, really well thought out. Um, so I think it's really, it's, it's tricky because it goes both ways and I still come down to it's about relationships, it's about mentorship and we can't, um, you know, we, we need to still really invest there for real change. Um, do you feel, though, that there's um, – one of the problems that we have with sustainability um, issues is that often the effects are very um, um, spread out. They're not uh, easily seen immediately in um, – necessarily just in your own backyard, in your own community. They're, um, they can be modest effects but, but spread out over large – geographical regions and large numbers of communities and the, the cumulative effects are very severe but the but the individual experience lived can be relatively modest and so I I see in my head a role for social media in at least giving people a sense of scale for what the issues and the impacts can be right when people are looking at their own section of a river for example and seeing contamination i don't think they're necessar necessarily mapping it to how many lives are being affected by the fact that now their their water supply is contaminated or their fish are contaminated or their food is contaminated and so on and so on so i think there's there's a a way that social media can connect communities and and individuals to to um, allow people to have a better sense of scale than they've been able to get otherwise other ways in addition to that, um, I also think that without social media, the unsustainable forces are already connected globally. Mm -hmm. Private capital, for example, is already connected globally. And uh, while I agree that social media is a tool that could be exploited, up until now, until the rise of social media, the counter forces, the forces in favor of sustainability, didn't have that tool to connect with each other. Whereas corporations, for example, that were engaging in garbage dumping in the global south when that is being generated here, there was no uh, impediment on their c global connections. Mm. And the ability of social media to counter that reach, I think, is powerful. Yeah, no, I mean, that is that is so true. And I think about um, the information flow that can happen and the visuals and, and being able, you know, when I worked on electronics, we were working on sort of the dumping, right, of electronic waste. And we could actually connect to communities um, in Africa or Asia where they were just sitting on our waste with children, using it as a playground while their parents burned off the plastic. So you can not only connect to scale, but, you know, to that impact other places. So I, I do agree with that you know, um, perspective overwhelmingly it probably makes it more positive. So um, we're increasingly aware that um, gender itself is not necessarily a binary construct. Um, 
well, isn't a binary construct, let me go that far. Um, uh, how do you see roles for non-binary gendered people within the STEM disciplines and in the sustainability ag um, um, agenda, right? So now we've got populations of people that are yet more marginalized than women are generally, um, and I think that's a universal statement. It's um, a statement that is true for uh, every community in the world. How do you see, um, how, do you see any hope or promise that as we advance the sustainability agenda globally, there's also an opportunity to bring more non-binary uh, folk to the table and have them be part of the conversation as well? Yeah, I think it's all up to us. I think it's up to us to create these um, communities and these spaces that are inclusive, that are welcoming. Um, so it's all about the art of hosting um, in our own spaces. We have to kind of lead by example. Yeah, you're, um, you have pretty incredible leadership in the UB's um, geography department on inclusive innovation. Um, and I've just loved using that term because it really does create that space um, for people to share similar experiences and challenges and, and work together. Echo. Um, I also, um, sustainability is not just about environmental sustainability, it's about human sustainability. And if we're not doing this work collectively by thinking about the voices of people who are marginalized for their gender expression or identity, then we have already undermined sustainability. So it's not, uh, it has to be central to this conversation. Um, and, and I'm just gonna speak about policy. I think policy, for example, is still outdated in terms of no. recognizing really? it. <laughs> um, so uh, perhaps this, your con question is laying some uh, groundwork for a future STEM conference. Ah. <laughs> Indeed. We can flesh out those ideas. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we are very privileged people. We um, come to work every day in a research-intensive university environment with enormous resources at our fingertips, um, enormous intellectual horsepower that we can bring to bear on different problems. Where do you see the role of the institution, of not just UB, but universities um, in this country as advocates, as voices for change, as leaders? How do we, how do you think about the university um, in um, the whole uh, process of affecting change for good in terms of sustainability and the regenerative economy concepts? I believe, um Every day I have the opportunity to come in and help shape young lives um, and contribute and encourage them and challenge them. Um, so I think it all, from my perspective, uh, lies uh, with our students. Um, we need to, they're going to be going out there um, and solving the world's problems. So we need to provide them with as many opportunities that help develop them as individuals, as researchers, um, as professionals. Well, I'm the only one who actually doesn't work for a university up um, here, but um, has not, never not worked with a university. Um, you know, Clean Production Action, which um, was the bulk of my career, was really created out of University of Massachusetts Lowell's Toxic Use Reduction Institute. And I think the pairing of universities with NGOs and other um, community groups is so critical to change because um, the universities provide all that incredible knowledge and um, research and expertise and community groups really can help provide those real world challenges and those can be brought right into the classroom for like this laboratory that I think we all want to be in. Um, and I just have never, uh, I've had this privilege of always working with a university um, on our team and I just think it's absolutely essential. So I just, education to me is still the most important um, aspect of, of change um, that we can invest in. In addition to education, universities are also large organizations. They have operations, they have um, 
services that they procure, and uh, to use food as an example, universities have the power to demonstrate change. They have the power to purchase locally. They have the power to engage in sustainable practices themselves. We're lucky that we have a chief sustainability officer, uh, but we could do a lot more. And then public universities in particular have um, really the privilege but also the responsibility of using public funding in the service of sustainability. And um, that, I think, is an opportunity for, not just for education, but also in research and in the operations of universities that we should think about. I think those are all great points. Um, I um, probably want to allow for a few minutes for questions from the audience. Kathleen, what's, how many minutes do we have left? Three. Three. <laughs> so, two questions from the audience? Has anybody got anything that they would like to ask the panelists? Any brave souls? <laughs> it might work out. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to get on the Hadar uh, bandwagon as well. <laughs> if you haven't seen Hadar and talked about what she's doing with Blackstone and innovation on the campus, um, please do so. Um, so my question is with regards to uh, failure and failure as creating a launching pad for your next success? And if you can share any of those personal or experiences with other people you've worked with where women specifically um, take failure and then go back into our little holes. And, and honestly, all of the entrepreneurs that I've worked with um, have um, taken advantage of the fact that a failure has just been their next launching point. Can I take that one? Mm -hmm. um, I want to put a pitch in for a program that we've just started here on campus, actually, that um, is called, it's funded by the NSF and it's called uh, the Navigate Project. And one of the things we're working with is women, or sorry, the, th the people we're working with are, are, are graduate students in STEM. And the goal of the program is to use case study methods, so, so case studies, to train the students to uh, navigate career adversity more effectively. But the uh, tool that one of the tools that we've been using, which appears to have resonated with the students pretty strongly, is the idea of building a decision tree. So instead of thinking one step ahead, that I'm going to try one thing and that that one thing might turn out well or it might turn out badly in a decision tree model, I, I'm gonna, either going to get a yes out of it or a no out of it, before you take that first step, build out a whole tree of of things that you could do. So when Hadar talks about the idea um, um, of going out and uh, finding your your allies, finding the people that are going to, to help move you forward, there's a whole slew of them. There's not one person. It's not like if I have an idea for a new company, I should talk to one person, and if that person says, no, that's a dumb idea, I should stop. No, before I have that conversation, build out a whole decision tree of who are the people I'm gonna go and try and talk to in order Right, and so get some structure around those conversations, and so that when you do get the no, you don't feel like, oh, that's that, I'm done, because you know you've already got 20 more people all lined up to talk to in your mind, right? You've mapped it all out ahead of time, and I think if you've got that tool in your back pocket, the idea of the decision tree in your back pocket, before you start that first hard conversation where you might get a rejection, it helps you ride through that negative and get back on a positive uh, ramp and keep moving forward. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Um, failing forward. Forward. That's that's like hashtag failing forward, yeah. right? It's a, we have to um, embrace um, the negative yep. that's out there and make it positive. You know, take the lemons and make lemonade. Or just say whatever, and move on. That's the other approach. <laughs> I'm going to use a martial art example. Uh, <laughs> <Should we move? laughs> Not at all. I think one of the myths about martial art is you do some fantastic things, but you don't. You basically get up every time you fall down. So the black belt is not a signal of success it's a signal of just getting up every time you get hit you stand up again and again and again and again then your white belt gets so dirty that by the end of it it's a black belt <laughs> 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 
That's great. Is there one more question from the audience before we wrap up? Thank you all for your insight this morning. Uh, my name is Rob. I work over at SUNY Erie Community College. I manage a grant where part of the goal is to improve women participation and success in the technologies. So with that, Dr. Folks, you had mentioned, what about the older women getting involved? So my question to you is, how do we support, encourage, empower, I'm gonna use the keyword here of upskill, women that are in entry level, lower level, skilled trades positions, think of a machinist over at Moog, so that they can become leaders at their companies, so they're part of the decision making process, so it's more equitable. So Dr. Folks, Dr. Raja, is it encouraging these women to participate as citizen scientists on grants? Uh, Ellie, is it encouraging those companies to allow those women to take time out of their day to participate in those types of activities? Hadar, is it helping those women to develop those elevator pitch skills so that they can convey to the leaders at their companies why they should be part of that decision-making process? Thank you. So that's a great question, which I, if I'm, I'm capturing it correctly, you're thinking about women who might be in the sort of the, the lower echelons of a, of a hierarchical structure and feeling like they have no, no way to influence the direction that the company is going on. They don't, going in, they don't necessarily feel they have a voice. What strategies um, can you think of? And from my own perspective, um, you know, and I can remember back to being, uh, you know, a very tiny ant in enormous corporations. Um, in my in my case, IBM and Hitachi, um, and having that exact feeling, like you can see things that are not right, but how do you affect change? Um, and in my case, it was very much about finding allies, uh, male and female, that were willing to inch that conversation forward. But does anybody else have any other strategies? I can speak from my own experience. Um, I do agree, the pitch is really key. Um, but one program that I participated in about four or five years ago was the Western New York Higher Education Leadership Institute. Um, and that provided me an opportunity to interact with peers from other higher education institutions, not necessarily just UB. It was two um, women from campus, from UB, with um, women from across uh, the region in higher education and to just through case studies um, to explore um, these topics and help build our really our confidence in being able to identify the challenges and the opportunities and how to um, impact change in our own campuses. So I think if you could do something like that um, related to technology, I think that would be really powerful. One um, really exciting piece that we've been we're exploring through the um, the core collaboratory for regenerative economy, which is um, working with the Material Design and Innovation Institute, is how do you create like certificate programs um, that help um, women and and others that are in entry level positions quickly get the skills to move up. I think the hardest like so I'm sort of flipping it to that what we could do is institutions and New York State providing these really readily accessible um, life friendly programs. I mean mostly you know you have to go in for another two years of school and women can't afford to do that. They're supporting families. How do you create women and family friendly programs that allow that really quick accelerated modulated adaptive programs i think that's something really important for manufacturing and and hopefully something that we can lead on in, in buffalo i would say you know your community intended community well and it, it's for a new program, especially simply having a conversation with a small group to start brainstorming what would be effective might be a good way to start thinking about what they would want and what they need. Uh, because sometimes, I know this was the case for me, uh, I was the only woman in an engineering school and my faculty and my higher-ups just had no understanding of what I needed. And a straightforward circle conversation might give you great insight into thinking about program development. Back to face-to-face -face conversations. Um, at that point, I better wrap up, otherwise I'm gonna be in trouble. Um, thank you, Hadar, thank you, Ali, thank you.
as well, Samina. Um, it was a great delight to have you here on stage with me and for this conversation, um, which I learned a lot from, and I hope our audience did too. Um, uh, each of you has a goodie bag to say thank you very, very much for giving up your time today to share your wisdom with us, and um, I hope everybody um, enjoys the rest of the program. And with that, I'll hand the podium back to Kathleen, I'm guessing. No? I'm releasing everybody.